In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about indexing documents, GIN indexes, data science, and generated columns. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 71. All right, I hope you're having a great week. Our first piece of content is indexing documents for full text search. This is from Dave's Postgres blog at pgsnake.blogspot.com. So here he said his, um, his boss asked about the new full text search in MongoDB that apparently they recently released. And he was saying, hmm, maybe we should do something similar for Postgres. And he said, well, we can do that already. So he basically did in relatively little lines of code. He says 36, but of course there's comments and some other things. But basically it shows you relatively easily how to index documents for full text search. Uh, the first thing he does is create a table. And this is for specifically indexing HTML documents. So he has a path, a title, body, a TS vector for doing the searches. Creates a gen index. On the column he's going to be searching the ts vector he then creates a trigger that's going to generate the ts vector whenever data is changed so upon an insert or update it will update this column and then he has uh, some python code here that basically goes through a list of files extracts the data and inserts it into the table he created and then lastly he does a search using this query to look for the keyword trigger within the documents that he indexed. And he also ordered it by the rank and then limited it to 20 results. And you can see those here. So not a lot of code to create a full text search when you're indexing a number of documents. The next post is PostgreSQL's indexes, gen. And this is from uh, louismeta.com. And it's basically describing uh, the gen index or the generalized inverted index. And of course, the first thing she mentions here is they're generally used to index arrays, JSONB fields, and TS vector fields for the full text search, as we've just seen. So this explains how they work at a pretty detailed level. She uses examples of crocodiles and teeth for doing her examples. But the key thing to take about the gen structure is that it is a basically a B tree index for getting all the keys and values but it doesn't store every instance of the value the way a B tree does, but what it's storing is essentially the key values and storing those only once. So one reference for every value. And then from there, it creates a list or even an additional B tree index to find where all those occurrences happen. So for example, she has a, a diagram here and there's a value of six. Well, that six only exists in one place, there's no other six. And a normal B tree index, if you had 10 different sixes, you would have in, in the leaf pages the 10, one index entry per row in the table. Whereas here, it just stores a single instance of it, but then an additional list or a tree that identifies all those instances. So here's an example of it where you have a value that goes to the leaf and then a posting tree here or a posting list. So this is what makes it very effective for identifying the occurrences of a word in a document or multiple documents or finding the occurrence of a value within an array of columns. So if you want to learn more about how a gen index is structured, definitely a blog post to check out. Now related to that is another blog post at uh, louisemeta.com called PostgreSQL's Indexes, Gen Algorithms. Now this covers how the gen index is used. So how it does uh, searching from this phase of scanning keys, scanning the pending list, uh, scanning the main index, and then updating the bitmap. And then she also goes into the process of inserting into the gen index and what's required for doing that, as well as deleting from the gen index. So again, if you want to get more in depth about how a gen index works, definitely another blog post to check out. Continuing our theme of indexes, there's the next piece of content is deep dive into PostgreSQL's indexes, webinar Q&A. This is from the uh, percona.com blog. So they did a presentation or a webinar. Uh, this first post, they have some of the questions that occurred during the webinar but they have a separate link here for, with the slides and the recording. 
and it actually has a PDF. And they cover things such as all the different index types from uh, B-tree, hash, bren, gin, gist, etc. As well as talking about uh, partial indexes, expression indexes, as well as things like index-only scans. So if you want a more general review of indexing, definitely a post to check out. And they have this uh, slide here, 22 of the presentation, where they're talking about uh, the different index types and use cases for each. Now, I found, what I found interesting is that they don't list a gen as a full text search option, which is generally the one that I tend to use. I tend to use gen as opposed to, to gist. And even looking at uh, the PostgreSQL documentation for uh, version 11, where they're talking about the gen and gist types, they actually list. Now, this wasn't always the case, but they've started listing gen indexes as the preferred text search index type. But they talk about there is some uh, advantages in certain use cases for using gist, but just something to keep in mind as you're choosing your index types. The next post is PostgreSQL meets data science and AI. So this is an opinion piece, but I actually think it's pretty relevant. So the first section here, they're talking about in terms of for data science or AI purposes, are you going to use something like PostgreSQL versus CSV files versus commercial databases? And they've run into issues with certain clients where their data quality within a CSV file is really bad. Like, for example, uh, he says, quote, let me quote, 3% was stored as a string. So, you know, with something like that, it's quite hard to compare different data. And he also included this quote here. If you're doing artificial intelligence, 80% of your effort has to go into data preparation. Only 20% are the real model. And he continues, uh, in short, you cannot seriously expect a model to learn something about interest rates if the raw data does not even ensure that the interest rate is actually a number. So in general, if you're going to be cleaning up data, you might as well put it into a system such as post a relational database system, such as PostgreSQL, where you can ensure data integrity and data consistency. And he talks about, you know, what systems better for sorting data, all the experience that PostgreSQL has versus writing your own Python scripts. Uh, what about filtering? Again, tailor-made for relational databases as opposed to trying to develop your own script to go through CSV files. So basically, what he says makes a lot of sense. And he actually goes into classical SQL analytics versus machine learning. And so many people are using the term machine learning where all they're wanting to do is just add up numbers or make a small prediction about what will happen. And basically, you can look at historical data and extrapolate. You don't need to use some of these uh, very complex machine learning tools. But he does go over some considerations if you are wanting to do uh, data science and machine learning or AI on some tools you can use, potentially in conjunction with PostgreSQL. So definitely an interesting blog post I encourage you to check out. Next post is how the CIS benchmark for PostgreSQL 11 works. This is from crunchydata.com. And this, again, the CIS is the Center for Internet Security, and they have a benchmark for establishing your PostgreSQL instance when running on CentOS that it is secured following a set of best practices. So they've updated the benchmark for 11, and they talk about the various areas that it covers in terms of installation and patches, directory file permissions, logging, monitoring, and auditing, user authentication, access controls, and authorization, connection and replication, as well as PostgreSQL settings and special configuration considerations. Like some of the updates they did for 11 are actually in reference to the SSL passphrase command where you can actually define where you can get the SSL passphrase for the private key when starting PostgreSQL on the server. So if you're interested in securing your PostgreSQL setup, definitely a blog post and a benchmark to check out. The next post is generated columns in PostgreSQL 12. And this is from secondquadrant.com. And they're talking about the new feature called generated columns, where you can actually define a column that will be generated based upon existing data in the table. In the example here, they actually used a concat function to concatenate an address to a delivery address that you can just simply run and use that will output the address uh, as follows here, basically broken out appropriately. Now, they actually had, their, had to use their own concat function 
due to some potential mutability that can happen because some string functions are locale dependent. So they actually had to generate their own function to do this uh, type of concatenation. But he said as another use case for it is that perhaps you want to generate in a data warehouse example, separate columns for uh, month, day, year, quarter, day of the week, things of that nature, all from a single date. And generated columns are a good use case for that. So whenever the raw data is updated, the generated column is regenerated. And he says, uh, you can't directly update the data, but of course you can index it. And then finally, he has a very comprehensive set of functions for splitting out this type of data in a data warehouse use case. So if you're interested in using generated columns in this way, definitely a blog post to check out. The next post is PostgreSQL interval, date, timestamp, and time data types. And this is from secondquadrant.com. And basically, they're covering all the different data types as it relates to uh, dates and times. So they cover the basic data types, talk about also talking about ranges, the different styles that you can use for defining your dates and times, performing arithmetic on them. Basically, a very comprehensive post showing different ways of using uh, date, times, and intervals. So if you're interested in that, definitely a blog post to check out. The next piece of content is actually a PG Bouncer update called Afraid of the World. Uh, the main feature added for PG Bouncer 1.10 is adding support for enabling and disabling TLS 1.3, as well as a number of uh, bug fixes. So if you use PG Bouncer, definitely an upgrade to check out. The next piece of content is actually a Vimeo video called Database as API with PostgreSQL and Massive.js by Diane Fay. So this talks about using PostgreSQL with a Node environment. Now, many Node users use MongoDB, but if you are wanting to potentially use PostgreSQL, Massive.js is a library you can use for interfacing with PostgreSQL. So if you're a Node user, this is a potential video to check out to see if you want to potentially use PostgreSQL with it. The last piece of content is actually a ton of videos in the last week or so have been posted to the pgconf.russia YouTube channel. Now, a lot of these are uh, in Russian and even the presentations, but they do have English dubbed versions for some of them. And I believe some of them are in English, like for example, this presentation is. So if you're interested in additional video content, perhaps this is a channel you wanna check out to see if there are any videos you'd like to review. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.